Hey, David, how are you doing today? I'm very well, and hopefully uh, everyone else out there is very well also. Absolutely. Well, uh, I want to dive right into uh, some of the things uh, from one of your slide presentations, uh, and it relates very, very much so to what will be near and dear to the hearts of most people watching this uh, on, on our program, and that we have noticed these uh, 200 to 400, maybe extending up to 470 year uh, cycles dealing with sunspots and terrestrial weather. And when I saw the chart that you had with the 230 year cycles, um, it really hit me because what we look at on the sun is normally a 200 year cycle and then a 200 year cycle and then we have to wait for 50 to 70 years for the grand minimum period and then another 200 years for, uh, you know, another 200 years. Uh, but what that breaks down to individually, uh, you know, if you cut the whole period in half, is about 230, 240 years. So can you introduce us to this 230-year cycle uh, in planetary temperatures and basically where, where you think that is coming from? Well, the 230-year uh what I, uh, what I call them is global warming, global cooling cycles. And this gives very specific cycles during the past 1,200 years, uh, where it was much warmer 1,200 years ago to 1,000 years ago than today. Actually, about uh, 1,200 years ago, Greenland was settled because it was much warmer. Uh, and then they had to vacate uh, that area. Uh, back about uh, 900 years ago because it got too cold again. They worked out of a global warming cycle into another global cooling cycle. But what we see is these cycles come pretty uniformly about every, oh, as short as 200 years, as long as 240 years. The average is 230 years, and we have five, or I should say six, global warming cycles in the past 1,200 years. Uh, and this lines up perfectly with the gravitational cycles of the Earth, Moon, Sun alignments and the cycles during the same period. So it, it's a near 100% correlation uh, due to the gravitational pull uh, of the Earth, Moon, Sun as tied into the oceans and the atmosphere. If you were to try to describe this to, to, to somebody, or if somebody listening was just to try to say, hey, there's this really cool 230-year cycle with the Earth, Sun, and the Moon, and it's based on, uh, you know, the, the new moon, the full moon, and, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the perigee and apogee, uh, the closest and furthest points away from the Earth that the moon is, uh, every 230 years, we see blank. Okay, uh... Well, in the temperatures, it is easy to see it. Uh, we could see it on 10-year cycles on the temperatures in the United States. Every 10, year, uh, 10 years, we have a upward uh, blip of warm period. And this is on the nine-year lunar cycle. Uh, every nine years, it's stronger. And these cycles blob out, out to a 240-year cycle. So what it is, it's uh, the strong cycles when the Earth, Moon, Sun become in alignment. And we have a stronger cycle uh, every 230 years. So I guess what, what I'm asking is, what do you mean by stronger cycles? I mean, so w we know that we get new moons and full moons every month. We get, uh, you know, a couple eclipses a year. Uh, what does it mean to have a stronger cycle like that? Okay, what it means, what it really means is uh, if we track the, what we call syzygy uh, cycles of the uh, uh, Earth, Moon, Sun, that's when the Earth, Moon, Sun become a pretty close alignment. That causes a strong gravitational tug on, on the Earth. And uh, these cycles can last for several months during a year. And actually, they go in a cycle where, uh, uh, due to the elevation of the uh, moon in the sky, uh, what we do is have uh, uh, different elevations in the sky that these events occur. And this affects the ocean currents greatly. And I was talking to you, to you earlier about this, about how the very strong cycles during global warming cycle every 230 years, it actually pulses a warm
warm pulse of warm water into the Arctic, and the Arctic ice melts from the bottom up, not from the top down. And then once you get uh, more free uh, open water up there, then you have a warmer Arctic and warmer winters. But then when it starts freezing up again, you're right back into the cold cycle. What you're looking for is not just an eclipse. Yes, an eclipse is a Earth, Moon, Sun alignment. But the power uh, of the gravitational tug on the Earth, uh, also you have to implant uh, how far the Moon is away from the Earth. If it's closer to the Earth, it's a, if it's a close approach to the Earth, it will add a lot of uh, gravitational tug. What I look at are the stronger cycles where you have not only a close approach of the Moon uh, to the Earth, but also the alignment of the Earth-Moon Sun. Uh, so we're looking at two factors, the gravitational pull from the alignment and the gravitational pull from the close approach to the Earth. When you have these factors, your gravitational pull can increase by as much as 47% above the normal gravitational tug on the Earth. Okay, so how often would you expect those two things to combine to create that? And I... I, you know, I can see where it's, you know, it, it can add 44 to 47% gravitational pull. Is that what happens every nine years and maybe it harmonizes out to 72 or does that ever only happen every 72 years? I guess so that, that 44 to 47% number, how often does that happen? Uh, it, it happens uh, pretty much on a yearly basis. Oh, pretty much on a yearly uh, basis. Okay. It, it does happen on a yearly base, but, basis, but what also happens is uh, there, uh, as you approach the stronger period, it happens on more frequently in a month. Uh, on the months, you may have three or four months in a row. Uh, it actually occurs about six months out of a year. Some years may be only about two months out of a year. Other years, if, if, uh, you have more months. Uh, so it comes into a stronger cycle. Now, these cycles aren't only the close approach or the alignment, but it's also the elevation in the sky because the moon changes from uh, as much as minus, uh, well, below the equator, uh, down uh, 28, 29 degrees below the equator to about 28, 29 degrees above the equator. And this is a four-year cycle where it'll go from the northern hemisphere to the southern hemisphere. And uh, it takes eight to nine years for it to get back to the northern hemisphere at the relatively uh, same elevation in the sky. That's your nine-year cycle. Okay, so that that is really helpful. So I that is something that... I think folks can get their head around. All right, so you've got the alignment of the spheres as one. You've got the proximity of the spheres as two. But it's not just that. The moon, you know, isn't tracking over the same part of the sky every cycle, but it should repeat every nine years, I guess is what you're trying to say. Well, that's right. And there's some of these cycles where it takes 18 years uh, for it to get high in the sky, like... Say if uh, today uh, we're at the peak of the cycle and it's 28 degrees in the uh, northern sky, the moon, okay? Okay. It will take it 18 years again to get that high in the sky in the northern hemisphere. It's an 18-year cycle. Because what happens is uh, nine years from now it will be at the lower elevation uh, instead of 29 degrees. It may only be about 25 degrees. Uh, there are some years it only gets as high as about uh, uh, 20 degrees in the sky. Well, you can have coastal flooding on a new moon or a full moon uh, without a storm on the east coast of the United States. If you have a very, very strong cycle, uh, just as much coastal flooding as you would on a winter storm. Uh, that's how powerful it can be, how much more powerful. Right, right. Well, I, I want to go now from the 230-year cycle out to the 1,100-year cycle. Now, the chart that you have in your presentation, it's, it, it's overlaying a temperature chart that I have seen and, and used and talked about a number of times before. Um, but this is actually fascinating. I have never actually seen this done. Um, 
like this before. Uh, it is not at all uh, difficult to see the cycle that you are trying to point out here. And in fact, even though you don't have the you know 5,500 years one uh, in there, you can actually see where it tried to where the temperature tried to come back up a little bit. It just you know kind of had a fail and you know fell right on its face there. Um, and so and even with that, you can really see this. And so what is this 1,100 year cycle? Where's it coming from? Because this is this is certainly going to be foreign to most of the folks watching our program. Almost like clockwork every 1,200 years, uh, where it was so much warmer back about 6,600 mm -hmm. years ago, uh, much, much warmer than today. That was just after we came off the uh, out of the glacial period. And there's there's reports of 50% less ice in the Arctic than today. And then, as, as you said, uh, about 1,200 years beyond that, it tried to warm up and didn't quite. But then 1,200 years before after that, it warmed up greatly. Uh, and then uh, the next 1,200 years, uh, it warmed up greatly and so on and so on, where 1,200 years ago, that was the last cycle, it was very warm. And then today, we're in that 1,200-year cycle again. So everyone's saying, oh, we've never been this warm. Yes, we have done. We're actually cooler than we were uh, 4,000 and 6,000 years ago. We're 7,000 years removed from the peak of the interglacial uh, warm period. We're heading towards the next, next ice age instead. And people don't understand that. Uh, we're actually cooler now, even though it's been warm the past 10 years. I, I want to get into a little bit about... Uh, you, you talk a good bit about climate pulses, um, and you've mentioned it a little bit here, but uh, would you mind quickly sort of defining, like, what is a climate pulse to you? How often do they occur? What do you look for uh, in terms of indicating one is coming, one is starting, and what are some of the effects you look for on the planet? Okay, as far as a climate pulse, uh, on climate change, what I'm looking at is that nine-year cycle. Uh, that's a stronger cycle uh, every nine years. So we get a uh, stronger gravitational cycle, and we get a pulse of a little bit warmer water into the Arctic. So we have a little blip in our temperatures where we warm up every nine years, and then it goes away. Uh, it's just a warm-up, and back down nine years later, you get a little warm-up on the peak. That's, a, that's what I call a climate pulse. That's the gravitational cycles of the Earth with Moon Sun interactions, uh, pulsing the Earth's oceans and atmosphere. And then that cycle works out to the longer cycles where we get our 72 year cycle. Back in the 1930s, very warm. 72 years later, oh, another warm period. And what happens in our global warming cycles? Okay, we have those two 72 year cycles. Well, you don't get one 72 years after that because you skip one cycle. Then 72 years after that, you're back in the global warming again. Uh, I don't know if you quite understand what I said there. Well, you know, uh, that it, it does make sense because you just mentioned uh, three segments of it, and three times 72 were pretty close to your 230-year uh, cycle there. Correct. Which, which, which you said was 200 to 240 years. So I imagine when you say 72 years, uh, you know, that could be 73, that could be 71, that could be 75. In, in any given actual circumstance, these are just generalized numbers that can help folks, right? That's right. And what my theory on this is, uh, I was looking at the new moon and full moon. Uh, on the long-term averages of the full moon, when we look at that on the 72-year cycle, uh, you can tell when it comes down to a lower elevation in the sky uh, for a long period of time. That's our beginning of global warming. And then when it leaves that position, uh, about 80 years later, we're into global cooling. And this is what we're going to see now. Uh, but then I see the interaction of the, if I, if I do the long-term averages of the new moon and full moon, they actually intersect on the, on the same plane, uh, which would cause a much stronger 
longer period of gravitational tug if both a full moon and new moon are kind of equal strength. Mm. So there, this, this is what I'm, I'm kind of trying to point out is there are so many cycles. Uh, the sun has very few cycles. The Earth-Moon interactions on uh, Earth-Moon-Sun interactions on gravitational cycles have so many cycles. This is what affects our, that we see fluctuations in our short-term and long-term uh, climate cycles on Earth and weather cycles. Yeah, well, that's uh, so. So that that's the basis, or you know, a, a basic introduction for uh, one of the things you do, which is create forecasts uh, for hurricanes. Uh, in addition to uh, in addition to seismicity, um, want to quickly introduce uh, you know the kinds of earthquake forecasts you give, and uh, basically what sort of information is is contained within them. Uh, correct. On the earthquake, uh, what I look at at the earthquake is uh, tracking the strong gravitational cycles. Uh, what I used was California, because uh, we have a lot of data on California, and earthquakes are frequent out there. So what I did was plot the uh, 6.0 and greater earthquakes in California, and I put them on my model for the gravitational cycles back to 1800. And you can track the earthquakes right up through the gravitational cycles. Uh, and of course, some people probably say, well, okay, why can you do that? Well, you, we have to remember the inner core of the Earth is, and you can help me on this, is a uh, very hot, molten uh, electromagnetic uh, iron. Is that correct? Or is that terminology not quite right? Well, it's, uh, I don't think anybody really knows what's down there, but okay. it's, uh... Are you gonna? Are you getting at its its bulge effect? That's right. So what happens on very strong uh, gravitational cycles? Uh, science has noted that the uh, inner core of the Earth can bulge by about 1.4, 1.5 kilometers. And that's a pretty huge bulge. If you have the inner core of the Earth bulging, well, matter above that must also be stressed or bulging. Right. And so we have the uh, plates of the Earth surrounding the Earth with the uh, uh, ring of fire, uh, the plates. And so the plates are going to see some movement or stress, I should say. And what I've seen on earthquakes is the big earthquakes in California do not occur at the time of the peak gravitational pull. The per uh, it's more likely to occur after the stress of the greatest gravitational pull, which means it's relaxing, and so the plates are relaxing, and that's when they slip. Interesting. An Interesting. Well, that's fascinating. I, I'm I'm very excited to to get more into this. Uh, uh, we are at the point where it is time for observers to do some of their homework. I think it's safe to say that uh, David, you're going to be. Uh, very much welcome back if you would uh, ever be willing to to come chat a bit more. Well, you're very welcome, and uh, uh, what I want to do uh, is teach people uh, on climate change and uh, the interactions of the Earth, Moon, Sun, and this is a very unknown field to many, many, many people, and especially in the science community where they do not understand climate change. And climate change is actually fairly simple if you use the right tools. Yeah, well, so you have to look at the right tools. Can't wait to have you back, David. Thanks again. Yeah. Thank you very much.